Edward Witten studied history as an undergraduate, so in comparative terms he came to mathematics late, but he's gone far. Without further ado, let's proceed to what I'm sure will be an inspirational talk. Welcome back, Edward Witten. I'd really like to offer a few uh, inspiring words today, but probably the real inspiration here is for me, having the chance to participate in this event with so many of the most talented mathematical high school students in the world. And you've all had such a wonderful mathematical education in getting the opportunity to prepare for and participate in this competition. It reminds me a little bit of my own mathematical education as a youth, but without going into any details there, let me just say that I think it's wonderful the opportunities that you've had. Now, living as we do at the dawn of the 21st century, the continents have been explored and many areas of endeavor which presented challenges hundreds of years ago, the same challenges aren't there today. But the one word of inspiration to today's young people that I would feel most strongly is that in mathematics and in many areas of science, certainly in areas of theoretical science that I know best, the challenges are just as wide and just as exciting as they ever were in past generations. Uh, nor are the problems going to be solved quickly, so not only for you, but as well for your younger siblings. You needn't worry that all the problems will be solved before you get there. <laughs> now, um, I thought that Today I was going to give you a small taste about the area of science that I work in, which is mostly quantum field theory and the effort to understand the basic um, structures of nature. And the mathematical connection arises because the laws of nature have turned out to rest upon amazingly subtle mathematical structures that have been discovered over the centuries and which, to a large extent, seem to be still unknown mathematical structures that belong to this coming century. So I've tried as much as I can in a single page here to summarize what the basic laws of nature were reduced to in the 20th century. So uh, in the 20th century, physicists distilled our understanding of nature down to two broad theories. There's quantum mechanics, which is the theory of atoms, molecules, and the subatomic world. It's an amazingly rich and subtle theory, which, when it was discovered in the 1920s, seemed to some people like it was an incredibly beautiful yet utterly impractical theory, but ultimately became needed by engineers and practical-minded physicists in a host of areas, superconductivity, transistors, condensed solid state physics, and many, many other areas. So in terms of the physics involved, one principle, a very strange principle that many of you will have heard of, is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which asserts that many of our familiar concepts, like the position and velocity of a particle, become, subtle, become fuzzy in the subatomic world. In terms of the math involved, it involved many surprising mathematical structures like Hilbert spaces that physicists had never expected to meet, but which turned out to be central in the subatomic world. While quantum mechanics is our basic framework for understanding the micro world, the world of individual particles, protons, neutrons, electrons, and so on, our basic theory for understanding the universe at large is Einstein's theory of gravity, his greatest achievement, which is called general relativity. General relativity is Einstein's conception according to which gravitation results from the curvature of space and time. Much like if you put a mass on a mattress, the mattress is bent and a marble on the mattress will follow a curved path around it, Einstein's conception was that the sun distorts the space around it and the planets in orbiting the sun are simply attempting to follow straight lines in the curved world around the sun. So these were the two most basic theories of 20th century physics 
And really, the greatest achievement of the 20th century was that a wealth of knowledge in previous theories was extended and distilled down to these two broad structures. Now, quantum mechanics and general relativity both describe part of the same natural world. So it must somehow be possible for them to work together. The strange thing, though, is that when you attempt to combine them, you run into hopeless contradictions, or at least in a straightforward attempt to combine them, you run into hopeless contradictions. The nature of the contradictions is that the nonlinear mathematics of Einstein's theory, based as it is on the 19th century Ramanian theories of curved spaces, clash with the requirements of quantum theory. Now, this problem was first perceived generations ago, and it's been pursued from many angles for the last 60 or 70 years. But there only is one angle which has achieved anything that seems significant, and it was not achieved by someone sitting in an ivory tower and emerging seven years later with a brilliant inspiration about a new theory of quantum gravity. That worked, as we all know, for proving Fermat's last theorem, but physicists, in the work of Andrew Wiles, from whom you've just heard, but physicists instead stumbled by accident on a trail that led them to what seems to be a new framework of physics that does reconcile quantum mechanics with gravity. This is the theory known as string theory, where an elementary particle is not a point object, uh, as I've sketched on this page on the left, but instead is replaced by a loop of vibrating string. Now, you all know that a string can vibrate in many ways. The whole richness of music, for example, comes from the fact that a piano string or a violin string or the note played on a flute is not a pure frequency, but contains many higher overtones, which are different forms of vibration of the same string. That's it's because of the richness of those higher overtones that we have symphony orchestras and not just tuning forks, which produce the pure note, but sound hopelessly harsh to the ear. So just as the higher overtones lead to the beauty of music, in string theory, the string can oscillate in many different ways, giving rise to the many different particles and forces that we see in nature. So although we don't know for sure that this theory is right, in the context of this theory, the unity of the forces is achieved by interpreting the different particles as higher overtones or different forms of vibration of a string. Now, 20th century physics was strange, but if string theory is correct, it introduces many equally strange and fundamental new ideas in the equation. So I've tried to um, illustrate this by um, this little magic square, where in the upper left, I have a picture that's meant to symbolize a 19th century conception of a, well, a conception based on Einstein's special relativity, really early 20th century, of a massless particle traveling at the speed of light in space-time. So space runs horizontally, time runs vertically, and the massless particle travels at a 45 degree angle in the picture, which is meant to illustrate propagation at the speed of light. Now this is a very naive idea, and Einstein elaborated it into the nonlinear wave equations for which he's really famous. The Einstein equations, which assert that the Ricci tensor of space-time is zero, and was Einstein's amazingly profound mathematical insight describing just how the curvature of the universe leads to gravitation. So Einstein gave one profound generalization of the naive idea of a light ray in space-time. But going down to the lower left corner, there's a different generalization of the idea of a light ray, which is the oscillating string. It's a completely different way of taking off on the light ray. On one direction leads to the Einstein equations, the other direction leads to the vibrating string. And somehow what string theorists are trying to do is to combine the notion of the vibrating string with the notion of the Einstein equations, and so to give what I've placed in the lower right-hand corner, where I've only indicated two question marks, perhaps to be filled in 30 or 50 years hence by one of you or by one of your children, who will discover the successor to the Einstein equations, 
that are related to the vibrating string the way the Einstein equations are related to the point particle. Some real progress was made in the 1990s, but as so often, it didn't occur in the direction that people suspected. If you had taken a poll among theoretical physicists at the beginning of the 90s about where progress would occur in that decade, practically everybody would have been wrong. People would have given their laundry list of famous problems that they most wanted to see solved, but what you get is often not what you guess or what you might have thought you wanted. At the beginning of the decade, we were in the situation that there were five conceivable string theories plus a wildcard 11-dimensional supergravity. This was tremendous progress compared to the standard framework of physics where there were infinitely many possible quantum field theories. But it still left you with the puzzle if one of these five theories describes our universe, who lives in the other four worlds? Well, that question was actually addressed in the 90s where it was discovered that all the possible theories were limiting cases of one still mysterious theory. This was done by getting a better integration of the quantum fuzziness with the notion of the vibrating string and learning that when we took quantum mechanics into account, the five string theories were different limiting cases of one richer theory. So by now we've understood after 30 years of exploration of string theory that there's really only one candidate for um, super unification. One theory that physicists have been studying from many different points of view for 30 years but without really understanding what it is and only in recent years understanding that there was one elephant. That some physicists were studying the trunk, some were studying the tusks and some the tail and so on as in the famous parable or children's story but that there really was one elephant that we were studying from different points of view but it's so dimly lit that there's a whole world to explore. In terms of experiment, the world to explore is, above all, that this theory has given birth to the notion of supersymmetry, which we hope can be proved at the next generation of particle accelerators that will be operating in the coming decade. Those of you who are interested are definitely on track to work at those accelerators in their glorious days as graduate students or after receiving your PhDs. And on the purely theoretical side, we know that there's a new mathematical description needed because unlike Einstein's problem where the pre-existing theory of Riemannian geometry proved to offer the right mathematical framework for what Einstein was trying to do, here it seems that there's a new mathematical structure lying behind this theory that physicists have grappled with for the last 30 years and still don't understand. So there's a whole world to explore and for, to the 500 young people present at this Olympiad, as well as all the other talented young mathematicians in your host countries, there's lots to do, both as theorists and as experimentalists. Thank you.